I don't know how you are about navigating in the Bible. Some of these books are sometimes hard to find. But uh, we're going to look at a book that's tucked away in the Old Testament today, just for a few minutes. So go to Psalms and turn left, and you'll pass Job, and then you'll pass Esther, and then you'll be at the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is one of those really, really challenging stories in, in Scripture because um, it has such great parallel to our own day. You may know that uh, the the Jews were in exile and uh, in Persia, and um, there was an effort being made to get back home. And finally, there was a king who was who was willing to allow that to happen. We first learn about Ezra, who is the book just in front of Nehemiah, uh, the priest who wanted to go home, go back to uh, to Jerusalem and help the people regain their sense of identity and their spiritual heritage. Nehemiah was a, a different kind of cat. He, um, he served in the court of Artaxerxes I as the cupbearer. And if you know anything about uh, cupbearers, you realize that this was a person who was pretty close to the king and was a, um, a person who was trusted uh, to help the king with such things as um, being close enough to advise and counsel. Now, he had no official voice, but somebody who was that close to the king every now and then, the king uh, would look over just to see what the cupbearer was doing. The primary function, of course, was uh, you didn't serve anything to the king that might be dangerous. So sometimes the cupbearer had to taste the wine before the king did, make sure it wasn't poison. But it's obvious that the king had developed a relationship with Nehemiah. Nehemiah um, had a brother, Hananiah, or Hananiah, um, who um, had been to Judah, had been to Palestine, and um, I've been to Jerusalem and um, kind of knew the, the landscape there. And so Nehemiah wanted to know, how are things back home? And Hananiah did not have a very glowing report. In fact, it was depressing, so much so that Nehemiah wept. And um, he was down, and the king could see it, and he wanted to know what was wrong. And Nehemiah told him, my, my country's in ruins. Uh, most of the people are here in exile. And it's just not right. These people need to be back where they belong. Well, the king could have gotten upset. He could have uh, punished Nehemiah. He had every right to do so. But instead of that, it was kind of a, how can I help if you feel this deeply about it? Well, it's interesting to notice that uh, Nehemiah went through um, a period during this time of, um, of, of deep mourning, almost depression. If you look at the Beatitudes that we started in our Sunday sermons, um, the first one is blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who absolutely know they need God. The second one says, um, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Well, if you think about it in relation to Nehemiah, you, you realize that Nehemiah was mourning and he was confessing. When you're spiritually poverty stricken, you realize you don't have anything to offer. Um, the Jewish posture of prayer was to stand with your head turned toward heaven and your arms outstretched, your palms upward, which su uh, suggested we, I have nothing to offer. I, I, I come before you, God, and I need you. I need what you can do. Um, so Nehemiah went before God that way, and he also went in a spirit of confession. And he, he knew that his people had strayed, that they had become spiritually bankrupt, that they had brought much of their trouble on themselves. But Nehemiah wasn't just pointing fingers. He was accepting blame. He was saying, me, my family, we too need to confess. We need to agree with you, God, that we haven't been the people we should be. And it's out of that period of mourning that uh, Nehemiah is given good news. And the good news is that the king will finance um, his return uh, to Jerusalem to see what's what's going on there and what needs to be done. Well, I hope you, again, as we go through these devotional periods, I hope that you'll take the time to read uh, the scripture. Nehemiah's a great story. And in these few minutes, we won't be able to get into all of it. But Nehemiah is um, a strategic thinker. 
when we think about our situation here at Williams, um, there's a lot of strategic thinking going on right now. Um, some efforts to define the process and to take our time to deal with the issues, to determine the true DNA of our church. And then what do we build on? How do we not recover the past, but learn from it? And how do we make our, our way into a bright and hopeful future? Well, Nehemiah had that kind of mind. Uh, he could look at a problem and begin to see um, possible solutions. Well, when he toured the city, he realized how bad things were. Um, the walls of the city had been uh, torn down. The gates were destroyed. It was uh, an easy place for enemies to uh, over, overcome, overwhelm. And he knew that they had to rebuild the wall. Well, he didn't spill his strategy all at once. He was very, very careful in, first of all, developing a team of leaders, um, people that could be trusted. Here at Williams, we have a transition leadership team. These are people who love this church and who want to see the best uh, possible future. Uh, and Nehemiah identified some of those kind of people for, for himself. And then as he made his way around the city and realized there were certain things that just had to be done, he did something else that was, I think, really, really brilliant. He began to organize the work in such a way that everybody took part. Now, on the 21st of this month, we're going to have our first congregational conversation, an opportunity for everybody to have a part. So if you think of what Nehemiah did, it's not really that much different than what we hope to do here. And that is to engage our people and to let people have input into the process, to share their feelings, their opinions, their hopes, their dreams, their concerns. Um, Nehemiah was able to organize the work in such a way that everybody had a piece of the wall that they were responsible for building. Everybody at Williams is going to have a responsibility to build the wall for this church. The kind of wall that um, is both a, a place of safety, a haven, a place where people can come who are hurting and broken, people who need to be loved on and encouraged. But it's also a, a fortress um, against the things in this world that are not right, that we stand for something, that we believe in the truth of God's word. So um, Nehemiah was able to assign portions of the wall to the various families. And it's found right here in, in uh, chapter three of Nehemiah, the names of the family, uh, the, the leader or patriarch of the clan, and everybody had a part. And what looked like an almost impossible task got, be, got uh, finished in record time. Now there's plenty of opposition. There are people surrounding Jerusalem, people who had kind of had stepped in the vacuum of, of, um, of power there. And they didn't like what Nehemiah was doing at all. And they made it clear and they did everything they could to uh, keep the, the, the building program from uh, reaching success. But you know what? Nehemiah was not um, cowered by it. He wasn't um, afraid. I mean, he was challenged and he knew it wasn't going to be easy. But he kept firmly in the camp of we're going to build not just the wall. We're going to build a sense of confidence, a sense of uh, accomplishment. We're going to experience success. And they did. And there were those moments that were so important um, in um, this whole thing where Nehemiah kept pointing toward the scriptural foundation, the spiritual foundation um, that was so important to the people. So when um, the people gathered, there was a, a, a spirit of worship. I know right now we can't gather like we want to, but we must unite our hearts in praise, in thanksgiving, in petition before our God, and ask him to bless what is happening in our church and give us the guidance that only he can give. Now, the people could look around and see, well, not everybody's in favor of this. Not everybody's supporting us. But Nehemiah and Ezra kept bringing the people back to our God is a faithful God. He has called us to this task. We will accomplish great things together. Uh, there is a spirit of celebration that occurs here in, uh, in the book. And there's one verse 
and it's found over in chapter uh, chapter nine, or, um, excuse me, in chapter eight, and it's verse verse ten. And as Nehemiah is speaking about how the people have responded and how they shared in this time of need and how generous Nehemiah was as a person and how he sort of set the tone for this this very, very important period in the lives of, of the people. He reminded them that the joy of the Lord is your strength. I think that could be a pretty good motto for us here, that uh, this is not about our efforts or how smart we are. This is about our reliance and our dependence upon God in a moment uh, when we can build upon the um, the legacy that has been established here in this church. We're standing on the shoulders of men and women who've gone before us and who've done some pretty amazing things in serving this community and representing Christ in this community. I, I think that realizing that we are part of something greater than ourselves is one of those glorious moments, but it isn't up to us. It's not on our abilities, it's upon our reliance. I hope we'll remember that as we think about how important it is to claim that strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. He wants us to succeed even more than we do. God bless.